So hi, my name is Natasha and I am a musculoskeletal physiotherapist and today I'm having a chat with Siobhan who is a physiotherapist at the Royal Papworth Hospital. So she's a physiotherapist for people who have uh, long-term heart and lung conditions. But I'll let Siobhan tell you what she does day to day. And uh, the aim of this chat really is just to provide people with some ideas and information of things that they can be doing to look after their, their lung health. So we hope it is useful. Over to you, Siobhan. <laughs> Okay, uh, thanks for introducing me. Um, so I um, cover across the whole hospital. Um, so we see patients with uh, heart or lung um, surgeries, transplant, um, or chronic conditions, um, mainly based on the respiratory side. So treating people with chronic lung conditions, mostly bronchiectasis, COPD, interstitial lung disease. Um, we see inpatients and outpatients coming to clinic, um, as well as people coming in for home IVs. And it's a real mixture, um, but it's a really interesting job. Yeah. And so I guess the idea with any condition is to self-manage as best that we can, our general whole physical health, but and also to prevent um, any sort of flare-ups in conditions or prevent any infection, things like that. So I suppose what I think would be useful is what do you advise people who come in to see you in terms of looking after their their own health? Yeah, so obviously we want to keep people as um, healthy as possible. So prevention is better than cure. The more we can kind of prevent chest infections, um, the more we can keep people fit and active, the better. So there's several ways we kind of try and encourage that. Obviously, focusing on exercise is one key thing. Lots and lots of like general health benefits. Um, but also in terms of lung and obviously heart health as well. Um, the guideline for activity is 30 minutes of activity five times a week. Um, that can be anything that makes you slightly short breath. So I think sometimes we're a bit put off by thinking about exercise as being going to the gym or an exercise class, but actually just going out for a short walk and um, going up and down the stairs, hoovering, um, mowing the lawn, all of it is things. Uh, if it's making you a little bit breathless, then that all counts. And it can be 10 minutes here and there. It doesn't have to be 30 minutes in one go. Um, we can also think about kind of chest clearance, so um, whether or not you do have any secretions on your chest that you feel that you need to clear, um, the more we can clear those, but that's a really good way to kind of prevent chest infections. The more secretions you have on your chest, it's a good breeding ground for, for more bugs, um, so it's important that we all try and clear that. Again, exercise can help that, um, as does drinking enough, so hydration, really, really important. Um, obviously not smoking, we know that smoking has a very negative effect on the lungs um, and the heart as well so that's one side to it and um, thinking about kind of healthy diet you know it's just about trying to choose the, the right lifestyle to keep you to keep you well yeah and I guess that would be different for everyone but it follows the same lifestyle kind of guidance for everyone it's all applicable to everyone in terms of our lung health our heart health our musculoskeletal system our bones joints muscles yeah exactly needs to keep active and fit and from what you said from doing all this exercise it's actually improving the capacity that we have of our lungs which will in turn will help with quality of life and all the activities that we want to be engaging in because we enjoy them yeah so I always think it's really important kind of like no matter what age you are what conditions you have um, or what starting point um, we see people that can barely walk a couple of meters from a bed to a chair um, but we also have people that are running marathons and super super fit um, so to me it's just about trying to improve from whatever starting point you're at we can we can all improve from there definitely and what are some of the that people can use to monitor sort of like you said, being breathless is actually a good thing and it's not something to be worried about, but there's a level of breathlessness that you kind of want to get to and not go past. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so we generally use the Borg scale of how breathless you feel you are. Um, so it goes from zero to 10. Um, zero we would count as no breathlessness at all. So generally when you're sitting resting and 10 would be kind of needing to call an ambulance, the most breathless you can imagine ever being. 
So we encourage our patients to be kind of somewhere between a three and a four when they're doing activity. And that to us is moderate breathlessness. So it means that you feel that you're working harder than if you're sitting still. Um, you're probably a bit warmer, perhaps a little bit sweaty. You feel that your heart rate and your breathing rate is up, but you feel comfortable. If you start to get to the point where you're gasping or panting for breath, or you feel that you couldn't say a sentence, then you need to stop or you need to slow down. And stopping at that point rather than getting to sort of eight, nine, 10 out of 10, severe breathlessness, and then needing half an hour to recover um, is ideal. Yeah, we, we say this sort of similar thing with people that come in to see us with uh, sports injuries, for example, that, you know, some discomfort is OK, but the minute you start pushing into your kind of barriers of high pain, it, it's not necessarily going to do damage, but it might cause some irritability and cause you to have to alter and change the activity that you're going to do for the next few days or weeks. So. I think it's the same thing in terms of pacing activities. Yeah, definitely. And trying to take your time so you can maybe get walk for longer rather than trying to think I'm going to walk as fast as I can for a short time. Mm. Actually, can we try and make it so that you're walking at a comfortable pace um, and enable you to get a bit further each day rather than focusing on the speed? Yeah, definitely. Um, what about things that people can do in terms of um, sort of sitting at home, maybe doing some mindfulness or meditation, but also focusing more on the uh, breathing elements. So like your deep breathing exercises. Um, yeah, so we normally recommend, um, there's lots of different breathing exercises depending on um, how much, how many secretions people have on my chest or how tight you are. Um, but one of the kind of bog standard ones that everyone can do and can be really, really effective is what we call the active cycle of breathing techniques. So the first part of those is what we call breathing control. It's basically normal breathing, but you'd be surprised how many people don't breathe correctly in their normal breathing. So it's really important that we get the basics right. And um, the idea is to breathe in through your nose, out through your mouth, nice relaxed shoulders, and the breath should be coming from your diaphragm and your lower chest rather than your upper chest. Um, it doesn't matter how many of them you do, it's just to get into a nice comfortable breathing pattern. When you're comfortable with that, you can move on to four deep breaths. So again, in through the nose, nice slow breath in. Once you're at the top of that breath, holding that breath for a couple of seconds. <laughs> and then slowly releasing that breath out, nice and relaxed. Um, again, repeat for another three breaths and then go back to relaxed breaths. It can take, um, can make you a little bit breathless um, if you do too many or a bit like headed, if you do too many in one go. So we kind of limit it to four and then your breathing control in between. The last part of the exercise is, and one of the things that people find really, really effective, is what we call a huff. So if you imagine you're steaming up a mirror or a pair of glasses, um, it's a hard breath out from the back of your throat. So if I just try and demonstrate, it's a <gasps> um, And that's really useful for moving secretions kind of from the upper chest into the upper airways to help them clear. Um, with the aim of that, we want to think about moving any secretions that are there. I always think about minimising coughing. We don't want to say don't cough. It's really important you do cough if you feel you have stuff there to clear your chest. But we only want to cough when it's actually worthwhile, when there's something there to clear, rather than coughing unnecessarily and getting chest aches and making your chest, um, your throat sore, your chest tighter. Yeah, that makes sense. So should, in terms of preventative, should people, would it be ideal to be doing some active cycle of breathing every day, would you say? Yeah, so we encourage it's something that you do every day. It means that you get better at it and you also know that you're, um, you know what your chest normally sounds and feels like. And that way, if it starts to feel any different or you can hear it, it's more rumbly or it feels tighter, you feel unable to take that deeper breath, um, then you start to know that actually maybe something else is going on, you're getting a bit of an infection. Um, it can kind of link in with your exercise as well. Obviously, exercise is getting you taking those deeper breaths. So sometimes I will say to people, actually, um, if you've gone for a long walk today and you've got a bit breathless, you don't necessarily need to um, sit through the whole cycle of doing those deep breaths, but actually just yeah. huff on the end of it so that you know how your huff sounds that day. Giving yourself the opportunity to clear your chest is really, really useful. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yes. So I suppose as long as you're doing something, it doesn't, not that it doesn't matter what, but it can be varied day to day depending on your plans and you don't have to be maybe so rigid and doing it as long as you're giving yourself an opportunity to expand your lungs and get some form of chest clearance or whatever you need. Yeah, I think it's really important to do what works for you. And it's just about getting used to your normal. Yes. 
Yeah. And are there any, is there anything else in terms of self-checks that people can just be aware of or that would be useful to do? Yeah, so one of the things I've seen recently is people recommending to um, do a 10 second breath hold. And if you know you can get to the end of that 10 seconds comfortably, um, then in theory, um, it's not a hard and fast rule, but in theory, you know, your chest should be pretty good. Okay. Um, you can also obviously look at your heart rate or your oxygen levels, and there's different monitors um, and that that you can buy. I always advise those with caution because they're good, but if you have poor circulation, for instance, or cold hands, um, they don't all show an accurate reading. So I think if you don't feel as well and it's showing a, a lower reading, then again, that's something else to kind of add to your awareness. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. But if you feel great and it's a bit of an abnormal reading, then, you know, rely on how you feel. Again, thinking about kind of how far you can normally walk and what your breathlessness level would normally be for that. Yeah, then yeah. it's about knowing, recognising when things are normal for you. Um, or when you're suddenly becoming more breathless doing the same level of activity, you know that you need to perhaps do something else. Um, or you yeah. need to be speaking to your GP, you need to be starting reserve antibiotics if you've got them. Okay, yeah, no, that's, that, that makes sense. That's great. Is there, I think that's probably enough to get people thinking about some things that they can be doing or looking at. Is there anything else you think that would be useful? We can link any uh, document links um, in the description of this video um, so that people can have a look, further look at any guide, guidelines or anything if they want to. Um, yeah, yeah, I guess just to say in terms of um, sort of motivation and keeping yourself engaged for things, it has to be um, things that you want to do. So we've kind of focused a bit on walking, um, but actually activity can vary so, so much. For some people, it's swimming or cycling. Um, sometimes having a, a partner or a friend come up with you is what's going to motivate you to to go, you know, arrange to go to, for a friend, um, to meet a friend for coffee, but you're both going to walk there together. And that yeah. way you can have a bit of catch up while you're walking. Um, it's all of those things that motivate us and remember you know the weather can change how you feel so you might not be able to walk as far if the weather's blowing a gale or if it's really frosty or really hot that might affect your chest more so yeah. being able to kind of adapt your activity to that is really useful it might be um, choosing to do activity at home so you know when you're boiling the kettle while you're standing there waiting for it to boil you can um, you can do a couple of squats or you can do a couple of heel raises you know, there's so many activities yeah. you can do in the home without having to think, oh, I've got to do my whole set of exercises now. Or yeah. the weather's yeah. awful, I can't go out for my walk. OK, well, what else can I do instead? There's so much we can do at home and so many options. You know, there's um, yoga or Pilates online nowadays that we can all access. So think outside the box. Mm, that's such good advice. I think having some sort of a plan, but also like you said, getting to know your body. So I wonder maybe for some people who are kind of beginning that learning about their body and how things work, maybe some sort of a diary or a journal, just so they can start documenting how they feel, like you say, in certain weather conditions, or they can just document how they feel and how they respond. And then it will maybe help develop that self-awareness. And like you said, so that they know what their normal is. Yeah, and I think, you know, start slow and build up. We've all done it where, like, you know, you go to the gym and the next day you think, oh, my God, I ache so much, and then you get put off. Um, yeah. As you said earlier, a bit of discomfort is totally normal and expected. Um, but, you know, if you can start slowly, it's better to actually do a couple of short walks a day rather than one long one. And think about kind of your energy levels. You know, we don't drive our car till it's completely empty of petrol. You hopefully <laughs> leave a little bit in the tank. So do think about your energy levels and just starting slowly and building up. Yeah, perfect. That's all so useful. And it's it's interesting how it's so transferable between, I think, all elements of, of health, physical health and physical conditioning. So it's really nice to see those links. Thank you so much for your time and your advice. And You're uh, hopefully people will find it useful and people can always comment and we can always do another one if uh, that would be useful for people. Yeah, good luck. Awesome. Thank you. Bye. Bye.